Hey guys, David Beebe here, and a very warm welcome back to the Solo YouTube channel and to another free lesson. This channel is all about Solo, the fretboard visualization app that I designed with my good friend Tom Quayle. Every week on the channel, we make free video lessons showing you how to use and practice with the app, how to get the most out of it. So if you're interested in this and you enjoy this video, be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified of when we post new content. So in today's lesson, we're gonna be practicing our fretboard visualization in the context of the infamous jazz standard, Giant Steps by John Coltrane. And talking a little bit about why it's not such a crazy tune to work on if you're a beginner to this way of visualizing the fretboard. The idea for this lesson came about from some questions we got in an Instagram live stream I think we did last week um, on the idea of structured practice. I'd wanted to do a lesson on the idea of this Giant Steps being a cool tune to work on and thought I'd combine the two and give this a uh, very sort of step-by-step, -step, if you excuse the pun, uh, systematic approach to tackling this tune and working on our visualization. So having said all that without any further ado, let's cut to the other cameras and get started with the lesson. So before we begin looking at these exercises and working through this lesson step by step, I want to talk a little bit about what makes this such a great chord progression to use for working on our fretboard visualization, regardless of your ability level. It doesn't matter if you're a relative beginner or quite advanced, we can use this chord progression for a number of good reasons. Now, you could be forgiven for saying, well, isn't this tune infamously hard as nails? And yes and no, um, it's got that reputation and deservedly so, but it's not because the chords are particularly difficult or it's advanced harmony as such. Um, the chords themselves are not too bad, it's just they move at such a fast pace and the way they move, um, if you've studied anything about the harmony and history of the tune and the Coltrane changes, poses some very uh, interesting and tricky challenges both visually and uh, technically on the instrument, on any instrument, but particularly on the guitar. And we can use it then as a vehicle for exercising our fretboard visualization. So we're not necessarily learning to play giant steps the tune as such, or we're not gonna be sounding like uh, Coltrane or any one of your favorite players on this tune. But what we are doing is hijacking the chords and using them to work on these particular tricky areas of visualization, um, both uh, visually and technically. To give you a quick example of what I'm talking about here, in bars one and two, we have the chords B major seven, going to D7, to G major 7, to B flat 7, and then it resolves into the third bar onto E flat major 7. Now each one of those chords in and of themselves isn't too bad, it's not that difficult to understand, but the way it's moving and at the speed it moves at, that's what poses the challenge for us. So to go from B major 7 as a harmonic field, if you like, as, a, as its tonality, to D7, is pretty tricky as to, as to how far apart those two chords are, as to both navigate orally in our ears and physically and visually on the fretboard. I'm not making a ton of assumptions for this lesson, but the prerequisites are that you're pretty good now at finding your root notes and that you've watched my Mastering Chord Tones video from a few weeks back. I'll link that in a card up here and in the description below, and also I'll link Tom's um, great video on finding root notes using Solo to work on your root notes. Um, I'll link that in the description below as well. So having said that then, let's start looking at these exercises and this step-by-step -step approach for tackling Giant Steps using the Solo app. With Giant Steps moving so fast and being tricky to navigate, we're not all that well served thinking with scales or using scalic language to begin with anyway. To begin with, we wanna be focusing more on chord tones and the occasional passing notes, which will result in these famous Coltrane type patterns. So to get started with this, what we're gonna do is focus on these chord tones, so the root, three, fives, and sevens. And we're gonna break that down and start right at the beginning by looking at, for this first exercise, the root and the third. And we're gonna apply a limitation exercise that we've talked about many times on the channel and in the solo lessons, where we're focusing just between a certain number of frets. So we're gonna block off this frets four to nine for this first exercise. Then we're gonna load up the level uh, root and third from the two chord tones section. And then of course load the giant steps changes. And we're gonna keep all the rest of the workout options as they are. We will be changing those a little bit later, but for now we're just gonna keep it stock and then we're gonna hit start changes workout. Okay, so within this area of this frets four to frets nine, 
we're going to find the one, the root note, and then we're going to work on finding the ascending thirds. So we're just going to work on ascending, and there's two possible ascendings here, so we can have ascending one and ascending two. So if I find my root here for the B, I'm going to go play that, solo checks it off, and then I'm going to find the third. Now if I first of all say to myself, well I'm going to use the ascending one here, so then I've got that. Okay, now on the D7, I might go find the root here, and now use ascending two. So I'm gonna use this one. Okay, so I'm alternating between which kind of um, intervallic function shape I'm using. Now go to the G, I'm gonna visualize that one here, and then go to ascending one. Okay, and then find the B flat, and then ascending two. And then I'm gonna find the E flat here, and ascending one. The A here, a new ascending two, for the flat three now, and then the root here for the D, and then ascending one. So this first step is just taking each of the different intervallic function set shapes for the three, be it the, 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 the regular three or the flat three, and then alternate between them chord to chord. So we're getting equal, um, equal practice at finding both of those ways of cataloging that three. So the next thing obviously we can do, and this is more important for most guitar players, is practicing the opposite of that, the descending versions of these intervallic function shapes. So if I restart that, and hit start changes workout again, so now I'm going to alternate between the descending shape one and the descending shape two. So if I've got my root note here, say, on the fret seven of the, of the high E string, Solo checks it off, and now I'm going to go to descending shape one. Okay, so there we've got the D7 now, so I'm going to visualize this root note here. And now I'm going to do the descending shape two, which would be that one. Okay, and I'm going to do a, de a descending one again from the G. Descending two from the B major seven, B flat major seven. And descending one from the E flat major seven, descending two from the A minor seven. It's a flat three, and that's compensated there. Yeah, if you check out the uh, intervallic function shapes in the PDF file, if you're not sure about any of these, of course, this one has to be compensated for the tuning of the guitar. Okay, and then we're going on to the D seven. So I'm going to do descending one, and then descending two from the G, and descending one again from the B flat. That step in and of itself can be really tricky if you're not used to visualizing the intervallic functions descending to them. Um, I've said before, many guitar players can get quite good and comfortable at visualizing what a third looks like ascending because it's so familiar and built into our sort of caged cowboy chords. We're kind of familiar with that. But visualizing down to them is a little bit weaker for most players. It certainly was for me before I started shedding this stuff heavily, but it's incredibly powerful when you can do it. It enables you to be able to maneuver around the fretboard extremely quickly and confidently with a lot of control and power. Oh yeah, quickly, before we move on, I should just point out that you want to apply all of the limitation exercises from the tutorials within the Solo app onto the work that we're doing here. So at the moment, we, I'm just demonstrating all these lessons within this position frets four to nine, but you want to take everything that we're doing and then apply that to frets one to five or nine to 13. Maybe you want to just strip it out and do it on individual strings, okay? Um, maybe you want to try it from different fingers. So everything that we talk about in the solo tutorials in general, you can apply onto this lesson um, more broadly. I just don't have the time here to go through and demonstrate absolutely every possible combination of exercise plus limitation exercise. So the next exercise really depends on how disciplined you are and how granular you want to be on really exhausting and systematically working on all the possibilities. So within the levels, you could do what we did on the previous exercise, but for all of the two chord tone options. So for the root and five, root and seven, third and fifth, third and seventh. I'm not going to do all of that here, obviously for time purposes, but you could go through and do all of that if you wished. What we're going to do now is move on to the three chord tones where we can really start to express the harmony of each chord coming out. Um, if we choose root three and five, leave the workout options as stock, 
Now we're going to get a much clearer picture of each of the chords and the harmony going by as we're working through it. So if I hit start workout now, what I'm going to do here, and what, this is what I recommend you do, is start off by practicing just ascending through the first one through five, and descending through the next. So I might go something like this. So starting on visualizing from the B of the low E string on the seventh fret, I might go one, three, five, and then come down from the D. So ascend up to the next D for the chord and then hit that and then come down. So I'm gonna to descend to the three and then descend to this five here. So what this might mean is that you have to change your visualized anchor point. So just what, what I did there was when I was on the D7, I was visualizing this D root note and then I used that to get to this three. So I descended uh, into valid function shape one to the three. Now, I, what I need to do is to come down to the five, okay? Coming down to the five. Now, I'm not gonna be able to do that visualizing off of this current D because it's beyond the octave. If we do our octave shape, we get here. And so I can't really efficiently visualize a coming down to the five off of this root note. So what we have to do is switch our anchor point and visualize now from this D in order to see that as the five. Okay, so in my mind, if I've got to come down that D7, a visual starting off of this note, I've got the root, I, visual, I descend down to the three, which is intervallic function shape one, descending, and then I need to come down to the five, okay, to finish this off, and then I'm gonna switch my visualization point to that root note, so then I can hook off of this one to see that as the five. So this is something you have to get really good at, switching your visualization anchor points. So I'll just go on a little bit further and keep demonstrating and talking about this. So I got to here on the five of the previous chord, so now I'm gonna to go to find the next closest root note ascending up from a G. So I'm gonna see this G here, and I'm gonna go one, three, Five, that's pretty straightforward. Okay, now I'm gonna go and visualize this B flat here and go one, down to this three, so this is descending shape two compensated. And then I'm gonna come down to this five here. So once more, I switch my visualization anchor point for the root note to here, so I can then hop off of this to see the five here. Okay, moving on to the next one, I've got the E flat, so now I'm gonna, actually gonna descend here and come, off of, come up this one, so I'm gonna go one. Now, here what I might do is I might actually go up to this three. So I've played this root note, but now I'm gonna switch again my uh, visualization anchor point to this E flat an octave higher, so that I can then see that three. Okay, so then apply this three, and then the five. I can see that five from there. Okay, now I'm gonna fall down to this root note here on the A, come down to the flat three, descending shape two compensated, and then switch my visualization anchor point to this A, and then come down to the five. Okay, so this is a great exercise in switching up our anchor points that we're visualizing from in order to create um, wider movement on the fretboard and be able to maneuver through um, multiple octaves. Um, which is something we really have to get good at. And even if you've spent a lot of time working on the intervallic function shapes themselves, it's super important and very necessary to be able to switch your octave points. Um, because otherwise you can get kind of stuck very locally and then struggle sometimes to perhaps um, manipulate your way around the fretboard on a larger scale. And this kind of exercise is really helpful for that. So the next thing that we're gonna do is be a little more free and less prescriptive about whether we're ascending, descending, or which of the intervallic function shapes that we're using. We're still gonna be very cognizant and thoughtful about which ones they are, but we're not gonna be explicit about the order of what we're doing things in. So if I just choose start, um, forwards again and start changes workout, <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna visualize this B here, come down to the three, and up to the five. Visualize this D, come down to the three, then I might switch anchor points and go up to the five, then I might come down to this G, down to the three, to the five, 
up to this root note B flat, up to the three, down to the five, up to the E flat, up to the three, up to the five, down to the one, up to the flat three, down to the five, down to the one, down to the three, down to the five, up to the one, and so on like that. In this next exercise, we're adding in the appropriate seventh to each of the chords. So we're getting the full expression of the harmony as written. B major seven, D seven, G major seven, B flat, major, B flat seven, E flat major seven, etc. Now when we do this and we choose the level, so I'm gonna go into level on solo and hit the root three, five, seven in the, under the four chord tones section, we get the temptation to start running these very um, muscle memory based patterns. So doing like that sort of thing. Now, in order for us to not do that, because that creates um, a very rote muscle memory thing where we're not gonna be as sure about what we're actually playing. We're gonna force ourselves by doing the limitation exercises to ascend and descend in certain particular orders. So again, you can be as prescriptive and as disciplined about this as you like. I'm gonna show you one example here, but you can figure out more of these for yourself as we go. So I've chosen root three, five, seven as the level. I'm gonna leave the workout options as stock for now. So we're gonna go forwards and I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit start changes workout, choose a root note. So I'm gonna find, let's say this B here on the fourth fret of the G string and play that. Now I'm going to initially ascend to the three. Okay, now I'm gonna descend from visualizing off of the same root note, but descend to the five. Now I'm gonna again, visualize off of the same root note, but ascend to the seven. So I change on to the D seven now. So I'm now gonna find a D to visualize from. So I've got one here. Now I'm gonna invert the process. So I'm gonna play the D, but instead of ascending to the three, I'm now gonna descend to the three. So I'm gonna go maybe down to this one here, descending shape one. And then off of the same D, ascend to the five. And then off of the same D, descend to the seven, flat seven. Go on to the G, so I'll play this G here and invert the process again. So I've got the root, ascend to the three. I might do the ascending shape two this time here. Now I'm gonna, off the same G, visualize descend to the five same G, ascend to the seven. So from this one anchor point of this root note visualization, I've got, um, I'm covering a lot of ground fretboard wise, um, visually and orally here. I'm hearing the sort of leaps in the intervallic um, functions of the sound of them. So as I say, you can be as explicit and as prescriptive as this uh, as you like, um, or you can be more free about it. And that's what we're gonna look at now. So I'm gonna go, come out of the exercise and Again, just leave it going forwards in the workout options, but this time when I do it, I'm gonna be less rigid about what I'm doing. So I'm exploring it more freely. So I might go. Okay, in this next exercise, things get a lot more challenging, but also a lot more interesting. What we're gonna do is randomize the order of the intervallic functions that we're looking for. And this is difficult because we can't just memorize a large number of set permutations, of course. We don't know what's coming next. So we have to be a lot freer and a lot more thinking on our feet or on our fingers about how to find these things. And also it's gonna be challenge us and be inspire us creatively as well, because we're gonna get new and interesting sounds to, to uh, be listening for. So within solo, in the workout options, I'm gonna hit random. So I've still got the level root three, five, seven, but now I'm gonna hit random. And then when I hit start changes workout, we're gonna get every possible variation of one, three, five, seven mapped randomly against each of the chords. And of course, it's the appropriate uh, one, three, five, and seven as well. So on a minor chord, it'll have the flat three and flat seven. On a dominant chord, it'll have the regular three, the five, and the flat seven, etc. Okay, then, so um, here we have the B major seven. I'm gonna go start on this B here and go one. It's asking for the five, so I'm gonna descend to the five in this limitation of this 
five fret zone, I can't go up to it. So I'm gonna go down to the five. Now I'm gonna come down to the three, still visualizing off of this here. Now I'm gonna go up here to the seven. Change chord, okay, so now we're on the D7. And so I need to find a D to anchor to for visualization purposes, and then find a five. Okay, so I'm gonna anchor off of this D here, and I'm gonna notice that I can play this five here. And that's gonna create a little bit of voice leading, and we're gonna, we're gonna come on to voice leading in just a moment. So I've got the five, and then I'm gonna come down to the three, play that one that I'm anchoring my visualization to, and then come up to the flat seven. Now I've got, as it happens, another nice bit of voice leading here. So I'm gonna visualize off of this G now, and then I'm gonna play this three. Come down to the five, change my anchor point for visualization down to this G and play the one that it's asking for, and then come up to the seven. Okay, find a B flat. Okay, so a B flat here. Then I'm gonna visualize, let's say this three. So I'm gonna visualize this descending to the three here. Then come up to the one down to the five, up to this flat seven. I'm gonna visualize this um, E flat and, and then play this three, and the seven, the five, and the E flat. Next step is to turn on voice leading and do the one, three, five, seven randomized again. Now what this is gonna do is start to bridge the gap between these disparate chords, especially in the bars one and two, where it goes from the B major seven to the D seven to G major seven to B flat seven. What we're gonna get by turning on voice leading is the smoothest connections to help our ear and our eyesight bridge, make these, uh, make these changes in the smoothest possible way. So what we're gonna do is leave uh, root three, five, seven on in the level, obviously giant step selected as the chord changes. Uh, we're making sure randomize is selected in the workout options and then also turn on voice leading. So what it's gonna do is randomize the one, three, five, and the seven over each chord, but then it's gonna move from the last note of the current chord into the first note of the next chord by either a half step, a whole step, or a minor third. And this is gonna give us the smoothest uh, voice leading options between the chord changes. So as we can see here, we've got the B major seven and it's asking for the three, then the one, then the five, then the seven. Now the seven of the B major seven is an A sharp note. And if you look down into the next chord underneath, it's saying that the next chord is a D seven. So it is now gonna move us smoothly from that A sharp on the B major seven, which is the seventh, down by a half step into the five of the D7, which is an A note. So the A sharp, which is the seventh of B major, becomes an A, the five of D7. And this is gonna help our ears just smooth out this chord change. So if I do that for you, I've got the, let's say I'm visualizing this B, I'm gonna choose the three here and go three, one, five, seven, now here's the change, here's the chord change, it's going to the D7, so I'm moving by this semitone into, smoothly into the D7, so I've got the five, and the flat seven, one, three. Okay, now that is gonna now resolve by a half step from the three of the D7 up to the root of the G major seven. Seven, three, five. So I'll just do that again a little bit quicker for you without talking and hopefully the, the smoothness of that voice leading and the chord changes is gonna emerge for you. So we get this cool aspect of voice leading and the chords really sound like they're moving from one to the next in the progression. And this is helping both our eyesight uh, and technically um, on the fretboard maneuver around, but also our ears get used to hearing it as well. So making sense of these chord changes, um, both visually, technically, and orally. For this next exercise, we're moving away from strict chord tones and we're gonna to start to incorporate some diatonic passing notes. And this results in us using intervallic structures that have been named over the years as the Coltrane patterns. And it's been uh, studied and researched and taught in this way by musicians. 
And the reason for focusing on these levels with you is because it reinforces and highlights this important nature of thinking in scale degrees or intervallic functions, the whole thing that this idea of visualization with solo app is based upon. So what we're gonna do is work through some of these basic levels and I'm gonna show you, just to again, explain the concept behind this and how we're gonna find them and utilize them and practice them on the neck. So I'm gonna load up in the level um, this comes under the heading of melodic structures. So we're going to hit melodic structure one. Uh, obviously, we've got the giant steps progression. I'm going to leave the workout options as they are for now. Now, very importantly, what's going to happen is that the major seven chords are going to be mapped across with the intervallic structure of one, two, three, and five. When it comes to a minor seven chord, that's going to be mapped across as the one, the flat three, the four, and the five. So if I hit the information button here, you'll see that pop up. So on the major and dominant chords, one, two, three, and five. For the minor chords, the one, three, four, and five. This is a very common way to practice these Coltrane type ideas and patterns. And this is going to give us a slightly different sound and it's going to give us a slightly different way to navigate and maneuver across these difficult chord changes with more information than strict chord tones, but not full-blown scalic information where we've got to juggle and think about, you know, full seven notes or whatever. So I'm going to find a root note. I'm going to choose the low B here on the seventh fret of the low E string. Um, and then I'm going to play through the sequence. So I've got the one, two, three, and the five. Changes to the D7 and I've got one, two, three, five again. G major seven, I've got one, two, three, five. B flat seven is the same. E flat major seven is the same. But now solo is recognized and it's mapped across the appropriate pattern for the minor seven, which is gonna give us the one, the flat three, the four, and the five. So now for this A minor seven, I've got the one, play it here, flat three, four, goes to D7 and it's back to one, two, three, five again. So one, two, three, five. And this will go throughout the entire progression. And in fact, as I said earlier, you can map this level or this, uh, this intervallic function sequence of this structure onto any of the progressions within solo. So I'll do that again, just a little bit quicker without talking. And in fact, if you're aware of the kind of Coltrane solo, you can start to hear a little bit of that idea. It's that sort of... So that, that kind of um, uh, sound is what you're getting is where he's going like one, two, three, five on the B major, then one, two, three, five on the D7 and so on. So all of these melodic structure levels within solo are a cool and powerful way of introducing notes other than the strict chord tones without us having to juggle all seven notes of an appropriate chord scale. And in this instance with the Coltrane type patterns, it's a little bit based in language too. And so it's kind of stylistically um, useful, but we have here melodic structures um, root to five, as you can see, and then the five through to the nine. And you could experiment on this tune with all of these, utilizing all the limitations that we've talked about, go ascending up, ascending down, and, and so on and so forth. A quick related side note, if you're really interested in this idea of melodic structures, there is a phenomenal book by a wonderful musician and educator, Jerry Bagonzi, he's a jazz saxophonist. And it's from a series of his called Inside Improvisation. It's called Volume One, Melodic Structures, and it would be a great companion to working through solo uh, with some of this stuff. I'll link it in the description below and um, yeah, check that out. Okay, so that just about wraps up this week's lesson. I hope you found it interesting and useful, and most of all, that you've got now an insight to this onboarding ramp of how we can take quite difficult chord changes and make them accessible with this systematic step-by-step -step approach of utilizing solo to find this information on the fretboard. So developing our visualization, our technical facility, and our ear training at the same time. So we can go from very, very simple in the early levels through to quite complex, difficult uh, exercises 
where we can even be quite creative with some of the exploratory work that we can do. So dig in and practice this a lot. You can do it with any set of changes within the app. I chose Giant Steps because uh, it's quite notorious for being known for being difficult. And I wanted to show that you don't have to fear these kind of changes. You can just take it step by step and utilize the approach and method within Solo. And uh, it's, uh, it's a really great way to tackle this kind of thing. Solo is available to download now in the iOS App Store. You can get it for iPhone, iPad, and the Apple Silicon Max. And as of next month, that's May 2021, that will include the newly announced iMacs with the M1 chip. So even more hardware that's compatible with Solo. If you've enjoyed this video, guys, please click the like button, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell icon to be notified of when we post these new videos. Tom will be back next week with another video. And until my next one, happy practicing and stay safe, guys.